Well, I just want to give a shout out to Preston there. He's being raised right. Men do not ask for directions. <laughs> they just make it up as they go along. Knowing that Jesus was fully God puts him in a place of divinity, but also knowing that he was fully man reminds us that Jesus moved and lived and operated in a sinful world just like we do. Of course, he did it without sin, but still he had to move and, and, and operate in the same way that we did with a lot of unexpected things that would come up in life for us, they do for him as well. And this means that among many things, that his plans could be changed, that his ministry objectives could be affected by circumstances that were surrounding him in this mixed-up, crazy world that we live in. Last week, we saw a significant change in his ministry objectives, and this all came about due to a petty dispute um, over some lesser concerns regarding um, baptism and this ritual of purification. They weren't unimportant, they were just lesser concerns. We know when we looked at this last week that he had come from Jerusalem into the area of Judea to spend time with his disciples. He would end up spending about eight months with them. And while he was there, he would reinforce his power and his message of eternal life uh, as his disciples would carry out their baptismal ministry. And what this meant was is that the revelation of Jesus was growing. His baptism, the baptism that Jesus, or particularly his disciples, were performing was not in conflict with the ministry, with the baptism of John the Baptist. John the Baptist's ministry did something else. John the Baptist's ministry pointed people to Christ. But Jesus' baptism identified them to Jesus, that he was now the final lamb. So Jesus' disciples baptized to identify people that the lamb was already here. So this squabble that, that comes up over purification was actually mute. Because real purification is in Jesus once for all. Now, we have seen this in a couple of ways already. We saw this in the cleansing of the temple, the the temple's corrupt usage that led Jesus to declare his own body as the new temple. We saw it there. We also saw it in his his, uh, revealing conversation with Nicodemus. And when he talks with Nicodemus, he leaves us with no other options that only Jesus gives new life. This new birth is the only thing that can make a person pure. But in all of this, there is a potential problem. Because all of this gets potentially sidetracked through this unessential concern about this ritual of purification. And should John and Jesus be performing similar ministries, baptismal ministries, so close to one another? And actually, when you read the text as we've been going through, John the Baptist really does a good job of trying to correct all of that. He sums it up in in chapter 3. You don't have to turn there. I'm just going to repeat it for you. But he sums it up in chapter 3, verse 29 and 30, when he says things like, he must increase, but I must decrease. And he uses that great wedding analogy. He is the bridegroom. I'm just the friend of the bridegroom. Now, being a friend of the bridegroom is is a wonderful thing. It's, it's It's a place of authority, but I'm not him. He's the bridegroom, and I rejoice in that. So all of the focus should be on him. But in his humanity, with all of that being said, with all of that ministry, with all that clarity, Jesus feels compelled. That's a word that came up in Mary's class this morning. I was sitting there in Mary's class thinking, this happens so many Sundays, so many things we talk about, are things that I'm going to cover here. What you didn't know is I actually call Mary during the week going, now what do you think about point number four here? And she says, no, no, don't do that. Do something. No, I don't really. But this is a word that came up, compelled. With all of this that's been taking place, Jesus still feels compelled into a change of direction, something that was unplanned for, but of course we know in the sovereignty of God leads to something else. It leads to a whole new place of opportunity. He redirects his efforts and it opens up his Galilean ministry. And this becomes another tactic. We've been looking at several tactics through the past several weeks. This becomes one more tactic to add to the list that we've been building on. And the tactic is this, and I want you to see this on the screen. It's it's the title of our message, that unexpected setbacks can lead to unexplored opportunities. Unexpected setbacks, we don't like them because we don't plan on them, 
but they can lead to unexplored opportunities. And the only thing that prevents new exploration from arising from old setbacks is if we just don't do it, if we just quit, if we just give up. Well, here's how this new unexplained direction unfolds. Now we pick it up in chapter 4, beginning at verse 3. Jesus has left Judea, and he went away into Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. And so he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well, and it was the sixth hour. What we're going to see here, and we're going to put a map up on the screen, because I want you to see this. And as we put this map up on the screen, don't get um, lost in all the arrows that are there. Because the arrows just kind of help to point out what Jesus has been doing for the last year. Jesus is a man on the move, and, he's with, and his disciples are with him. But he's a man on the, move, uh, on the move here. He's been baptized in the Jordan River. Now, if you cannot see the, the map there, and if you see the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea, and the Jordan River connects them. At the top of the Dead Sea, where the Jordan River enters in, that is where Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. And from this time on, he has gone from one end of Israel to the other. After his baptism... He travels about 80 miles north, and if you look kind of towards the top of the map there, to attend that wedding in Cana. And while there, he ends up making a short visit to Capernaum, which is kind of a little bit more to the top, to the right, which is about another 20 miles northeast. Then from there, he goes back down to Jerusalem. He goes south for Passover, which again is about another 80-mile journey. Then he goes up to the outskirts of Judea, the countryside there, which is about another five miles north. And that is where this debate arises. And that's where he decides to alter his plans and then to go back north into Galilee, which is another 60 miles. Did you catch all that? Did you you stay on top of all that? Were you able to follow it? And the interesting thing about all this is is that with every movement he makes... He walked. He walked. There were no buses, no subways, no caravans. There were caravans in that day, but we have no record that Jesus ever was a part of a caravan. No Dodge caravans. He walked. You know, it's interesting that when you read the Gospels, we are never told that Jesus ever rode a pack animal anywhere except for his triumphal entry when he comes in on on a donkey. And all of this traveling takes place within the first year of his active ministry life. And there's already a snafu. But it's what leads him to his second recorded personal contact. Now I say second recorded, I'm talking about his official ministry. Yes, he's gathered his disciples together and he's had personal contact with them. But as far as his official ministry beginning, this is his second recorded personal contact, this time with a woman on the opposite side of the social scale than that of Nicodemus. She is a Samaritan. In fact, when, you, when we get into the account, we find that she's actually lived a somewhat of a disreputable life, the opposite kind of life that Nicodemus would have had. And yet we're going to find that the message to both of them is exactly the same. Now what we're going to do is we're going to spend today in the next couple of weeks here We're going to look at seven stages that Jesus went through. And from this will be like seven stages that we can possibly go through in our unexpected, unexplored opportunities in uh, communicating the, the simple gospel and sound doctrine, which just simply means that people are going to need the Bible in all kinds of ways. They are going to meet the Bible in all kinds of ways. But the very first thing is we want to make sure that the object of Jesus Christ is in place. Because as much as sinful humanity tries, we cannot pretend like there is no relationship between us and God's only plan for our rescue, and that is the gospel. Now, of course, we know that people do reject the gospel. Some people will scoff at it. Others will consider it to be foolish or you're just simply out of touch with the way that the world really works. Some will politely dismiss it. But this doesn't change that God's full desire is for another human being to come to know his son, to gain eternal life. And I have to remember that, especially when I am faced with some kind of stiff resistance. 
I may have to leave the presence of someone that I've been talking to. I've been sharing the gospel with them, and there's just resistance, and they don't want to talk about it anymore, and I have to leave their, their presence. But as I do that, I have to remain convinced that God still wants that person saved. And then, of course, we know that there are many who accept it. They commit their lives to its truthfulness, and they desire others to be convinced of its message of love and grace and sacrifice and hope. Just reading this week about a Christian pastor in India. I don't know if you saw this story. India is a nation of Hindus, basically. There's 1.3 billion people that live in India. 65 million are Christians. That sounds like it's a big number, and it is, but compared to 1.3 billion, it's not. And this Christian pastor in India has been ministering in his church for about 15 years. He's been harassed. He's been beat up. He has been abused for his faith. He was eventually hung by a, a radical Hindu group in his own church. This is a guy who was convinced of the love and grace and sacrifice of Jesus. And what's going to happen here is Jesus is going to teach all of this again to this woman from Samaria. So here's the first stage. The first stage that we want to experience is going to be that of compelled. Am I compelled to the gospel? Again, one of those words that came up in Mary's class. Am I compelled to the gospel? And what we're going to find here, when it comes to Jesus, that neither an altered plan or an ailing body prevented him from sharing his message of hope. And we're going to pick it up at verse 5 again. This time we're going to read a little bit farther down through verse 8. So Jesus comes to a city called Samaria, or, or in Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well, and it was the sixth hour. And there came a woman of Samaria to draw water. So Jesus says to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Okay, so the first question we want to ask is, why does he stop here? And the simple answer is, is because, yes, there's a sovereign plan that is at work here. But there's also something else that is at work here. It's just as sovereign, but it's just as needy. We learn in verse 6 that he's tired. There's the sovereign plan. He's tired and he's thirsty. Jacob's well was on the direct route to go from Judea, heading north. And you would have to stop there to, to rest and to resupply for water. Because it's a long journey. It's a hefty, hot journey, and you would be thirsty. And we also learn from verse 6 that it's the sixth hour, which means that it's noon. It's the hottest part of the day. And Jesus, look at this, was wearied from the trip. That's what verse 6 says. Now, we want to look at this for a moment because it's really important. That word wearied is what opens up the entirety of the conversation. That word wearied is what opens up the entirety of this ministry that's going to take place in Samaria. Now, when we translate things into English, the word wearied is not wrong and it's not bad. It's just that in Greek, words tend to be more explicit. If you, were, if you had a Greek thinking mind and you heard this word, you'd be thinking other things. When I see the word wearied, and I'm going to tell you first what the word does not mean, because this is typically what we think of. The word wearied here does not mean that Jesus just stopped and his disciples just stopped to take a break. That's what I typically think when I'm wearied. That's not what this is here. They're not just stopping here to catch their breath. It is a very precise verb form in the original language. And what this verb form does is it depicts his humanity. Jesus is exhausted. He is wiped out. He is beat out. So his disciples would be too. In fact, the noun form is much more revealing. The noun form means to literally beat someone or to beat something into submission. It'd be kind of like that metal worker who is just beating that, that piece of metal into the shape that he desires, or a slave who is beaten and broken of their will. Now, we've all kind of been there probably a few times in our lives. And I point this out in some detail here because I want to emphasize that when you are in this state, at least I know this is the way that I am when I'm in this state, and I would suspect you're probably the same way, that when I am in this state, I mean not just catching my breath, I mean really, really wiped out. I feel like a metal worker has just been beating on me all day. I can tell you that the last thing I want to get into is a lengthy discussion about religion. 
I can remember coming home when my kids were still in the house, you know, 6 and 8 and 10 and 12, and I'd come in the door, and I'd have, at that time you had briefcases, I'd come in the door with my briefcase, and I would have one of those rare days, I'm just completely whipped. And I would walk in the door, because this is what would happen a lot. I couldn't even put my keys down or set my briefcase down, and I'd have the kids run down. Daddy, Erica said this to me today, and Rachel did this, and Mama said we couldn't do this, and it's like, can you at least wait? And the last thing I want to talk about are these problems in the house right now. Multiply that about 10 times when it comes to being in that condition and wanting to talk about religion. And in verse 7, we find something else that's very sovereign but very human here. He's not drawing out his own water. You know why? Because it seems like the disciples, who we are told, because we're extracting from the text here, we are told that they went into the city to buy food. Now, again, I'm, I'm always very careful that we perform exposition on a passage. It's called exegesis. You perform exegesis all the time. If you don't, you're in trouble. Whenever you have directions on anything, whenever you're reading instructions, you must do exegesis. You must pull out what the writer is saying. You don't want to read into it. I read into things all the time, and that's why I mess a lot of things up. But you want to pull out from the text. That's proper exegesis. That's what we're going to do here. Because what happens in verse 7, and you can make inferences as you pull things out. So he's sitting there. His disciples have gone into town. He's wearied. He's beat out. I would assume that the disciples were wearied and beat out too. Apparently, they all got their drinks of water and then left him with nothing. So he's sitting there all by himself, and he doesn't have anything to draw out water. And so what happens is a Samaritan woman shows up. And he appeals to the woman to give him a drink. Now, he does this contrary to what some critics say. He does not do this to exhibit some kind of first century male chauvinism. He appeals to her to give him water because he's whipped. And he has nothing to draw out the water with. Because it takes a little bit of physical dexterity to draw water from a well. But he doesn't allow his ailing body, or his less than timely circumstances to dictate his commitment to this message here. And I want to be careful about the implications that we might draw from this. The lesson here does not assume, we are not assuming that there's never a time that I can be so truly worn out or exhausted or overloaded, and because of that, it seriously hampers my ministry capabilities where I really just knew, need to take some serious rest alone away from others. That's not what we're saying because that certainly does happen to us. It happens to Jesus. There's at least two occasions that, that Luke records when Jesus just had to get away. He had to get away from people and he had to get away from his disciples. I've had those occasions, as I've mentioned before, when I just did not want to engage in serious spiritual contact with people because I was just too physically or emotionally or spiritually worn out. And yet, in some of those moments, it would still happen. I could see it coming. I didn't want to do it inside. I just didn't, but I could see it coming. And I didn't always receive it well. So what I had to do is I had to realize I needed some kind of conditioned response to those times. It's actually what Jesus does here. This is exactly how he approaches this woman here. When the opportunity presented itself, this is the conditioned response. When the opportunity presented itself before me, meaning I wasn't out there looking at it. I'm talking about those times when I'm just physically or emotionally or spiritually just wiped out. I really don't want to engage. But if it presented itself, I wasn't out looking for it. I wanted to remain committed. Jesus is doing exactly that here. Jesus is sitting here. He's just resting. Yes, it's cosmic. Yes, it's sovereign. But it's all still very, very human. And the woman shows up. So Jesus takes advantage of his own weariness just simply to ask for water because he can't get it on his own, at least not at the moment. So if God had allowed the opportunity, if he had caused the opportunity to arise when I was really tired, what I decided is that then I would just do my best to follow it up. But I wouldn't go looking for it at those times of immense weariness in my life. Because here's the thing, and I want you to see this on the screen. True weariness. Now I'm not talking about just 
being lazy. I've been lazy at times, and I know the difference between just being lazy and being truly wiped out. I would sometimes excuse my laziness as being really wiped out, but I knew the difference. So I'm not talking about laziness. I'm not talking about apathy here. True weariness is a real reason to rest and to remove yourself. But the thing is, God will at times use your weariness for some greater purpose. Jesus' weariness here, which is used by God for this woman, opens up his entire Galilean ministry with this woman leading the way. So when that happens to you, I would encourage you, just simply don't give up on your compulsion too early. When it presents itself, use it. Use it. Sometimes our weariness becomes God's greatest strength and movement in our lives. That's the first stage. The second stage that we might want to expect is that when the opportunity does present itself, seek a connection point. Look for a connection point to the gospel. What Jesus does is he simply uses the immediate encounter, the setting here with the woman at the well to his advantage. And he quickly highlights her need for something more than just the immediate purpose for which she came there. Let's read from verse 9 down through verse 14. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I'm a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answers and says to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. She says to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get this living water? You're not greater than our father Jacob, are you? who gave us the well, and he drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? Jesus answers and says to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give him shall never thirst, but the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water, springing up to eternal life. This connection point brought him to the place at this particular time, because without it he would not be here, and none of this would have unfolded at all. Jesus' immediate need and her immediate need cross paths. We know he is really, really tired. But it's because of this that he's able to connect with her. And it leads him to highlight a greater issue, and that is eternal life. But there's something else at work here. Adding to the weariness, there's also a a serious cultural complication. She is from Samaria which means that she is from the other side of town that pure cultural Jews would rather not talk about. In point of fact, what Jews would often do is they wouldn't travel through Samaria. If you were down there like where Jesus was baptized, and Samaria is here, and this is the Jordan River, some Jews who did not want to risk ceremonial impurity would cross over the Jordan River, go on to the east side, come up that way so they could bypass Samaria and then go in to some other part of Israel if they wanted to because they didn't want to defile themselves. And this is something that just goes back a long, long way. The problem with all this, though, is that the Samarians are actually cousins to the Jews, but they are of mixed blood. This goes back some 700 years to their captivity in Assyria. And while they were in Assyria, they were able to live their lives, and so many of them began to intermarry. And when they had children, those children are the ones that became known as Samaritans. But this created all kinds of cultural and theological problems for pure Jews because Samaritans were considered to be idolatrous. And it was defilement to have any kind of contact with them. Can you imagine? So what what would that put you at if if you were a Jew trying to live for Jesus and you were looking for a connection point But you've got this terrible cultural taboo that's out there. Another question would come up too. Samaritans were not followers of the law of Moses. So to what extent were they entitled to the blessings of Abraham? If you notice in verse 12, even the woman refers to Jacob as her cultural father, as any Jew would do. You know, Jacob is the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. And she's very much aware of the centuries-old taboo that that Jews and Samaritans have no dealings with one another, not even on the level of common courtesy. Look at verse 9 again. So the Samaritan woman says to him, 
Now, can you imagine? Jesus is there by himself, as far as we know. She notices he doesn't have anything to draw water out with. He just asks for a cup of water. And the whole, the whole scene there just changes. She says to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, would ask me for a drink? Since I'm a Samaritan woman. And notice that John, the gospel writer, even adds in his own commentary there, which you probably have in parentheses, because Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Everybody knows this. But Jesus' connection to her with the gospel of life somehow swallows up all of these prejudicial boundaries. And he uses his weariness and her need for water to express this. The Samaritan woman comes for water. Jesus needs water. That right there is the simple connection point. And then you have one simple question. One simple request in verse 7 that starts it all. Uh, excuse me, ma'am, can you give me a drink? That's it. It starts everything here. And from that simple question comes all this, this, this terrible cultural taboo. Wait a minute, buddy. Don't you realize you shouldn't be talking to me? Aren't you afraid of the backlash? I mean, you're talking to a Samaritan, and on top of that, I'm, I'm a woman? Now, what that means is really serious stuff. Here's what this woman would know. Here's what any good cultural Jew would know. They would know, this woman would know, look, if I give you a cup of water, and you reach out and you take that cup of water and your hand touches my hand, you're declared unclean. And even worse, if your hand touches my hand and you take my cup and you drink water from my cup, you will be defiled. That is a ceremonial pollution for a Jew. And she knows this. And this is a true stumbling block. I mean, as silly as it might sound to us, it wasn't to them. And we have our own still today. But notice clearly, Jesus doesn't use this moment to engage in that non-essential. See, this is where I would. I've told you in the past. I just mentioned this last week. I've said it before. This is one of my weaknesses. I like to engage in these things. And I'd feel like I've got to get this all cleared up before I talk about Jesus. I've got to really watch myself with that. I really do. And that's where I would begin to engage this. But he doesn't. Because it's not essential. Now, that doesn't mean it wouldn't be worth talking about later on. It would be. But at the moment, the object of truth is right there before her. So he sidesteps the prejudice and all this legalism to keep to the point. Verse 10. Jesus answers and says to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. It's kind of like Jesus saying, Oh, oh wait, ma'am, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I'm just asking you for a cup of water. That's it. Oh, and by the way, even though I'm really, really thirsty, since we're talking about water, you know, if you really knew who it was who said to you, Give me a cup of water, you'd be asking me for living water. So what happens now? What happens now? Well, now the prejudice is set aside, and she is intrigued by this. Verse 11 and 12 again. So she says to him, Sir, now you don't have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. There again, that's that implication. We're drawing out an implication here. Yeah, you know, when I came up, you're just kind of sitting here all by yourself. I can notice you don't have a pail, you don't have a rope, you don't have a, a you know, ladle, nothing. So, sir, you have nothing to draw with. And the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? You're not greater than our father Jacob, are you? Who gave us this well. He drank from himself all of his sons, meaning all the people after him and all the cattle after them. So it's kind of like she's saying, wait a minute, are we still talking about the same thing here? You don't have anything to get water with. The well is deep. Sometimes these wells can be up to 100 feet deep. And she is thinking in terms of running water. Water that, in a sense, would kind of spring up. And she tells him, wait, not even Jacob, not even all of his descendants had anything like that. Are you better than him? Which means this water that you're offering here, is it better? Is it, is it more available to the thousands who have traveled here over the centuries? I mean, Jacob never said anything about water like that. So his answer eventually is going to be, well, yeah, my water is better. But he's not going to say it like that. 
He has avoided the inessentials and he has her full attention pointing to the right object. So now he is going to deepen the application using this analogy of living water. We all need water to live physically, but there is a different kind of water. Yes, a better kind of water to live spiritually. And remember, all this started with a really, really tired Jesus simply asking for a drink of water. And I want you to notice something else here. In fact, you can think about this for a second. What is not here? What would you think would be here already? What? Somebody say it. He hasn't gotten his drink yet. His disciples didn't leave him anything. He's asked the woman for a drink of water, and she's off in a whole different direction, which is okay with him because it's the direction he wants her to go in. He still hasn't gotten his drink of water. You know, dry mouth, dry throat, that kind of thing. But it gets real complicated real fast, as things so often seem to do. Can't you just give me a drink? No, I can't. I can't. I can't. Too many restrictions, too many taboos. Okay, fine. What if I offer you a drink that will quench your thirst forever? Verse 13 and 14. So Jesus says to her, everyone who drinks of this water that I'm telling you about will never thirst again, or everyone who drinks of the water that you're getting will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give them shall never thirst. But the water that I will give them will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. This connecting point for the gospel takes this woman to the place of growing interest. Because now we're talking about something that goes beyond, way beyond, just water in a well. Now we're talking about eternal life. So if I am compelled by the gospel and I am connecting that message to another life, what I want to do is begin to look for this third stage, and that is conviction. Look for any kind of conviction in that person's life from the gospel. The Samaritan woman, she draws a shallow perception at first of her need for eternal life. Verse 15, the woman says to him, Sir, then give me this water. But why does she want it? It's just a shallow connection, but why does she want it? So that I will not be thirsty, nor will I have to come all the way here to draw again. Hey, if I can just be in my house and turn the tap on, which I don't even know what a tap is at that time, but if it can do something like that, that's what I would like. Sure, I'll take that. She has not quite made the connection. She hasn't put all the dots together yet, but it's going in the right direction. And when you're at that place in somebody's life, Allow them to do it. Something else that came up in Mary's class is the whole idea of we don't want to just shake people to believe in Jesus. Sometimes you feel like it, but you don't want to shake people to, to, to believe in Jesus. Allow them to connect the, 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 the dots, but just don't stop. People usually don't make big leaps of faith. Now, I know somebody in here might have a story like, oh, yeah, you know, I was really lost and, and this was going on in my life and it was terrible and I heard about Jesus and I trusted him. And that's great. Those are powerful stories. But even in those powerful stories that you think is a leap of faith, if you went back and really honestly looked at everything, there were probably 20 things that happened that led you to that. People don't usually make leaps of faith. As he says to her, look, if you have water that's different, better, longer lasting, then what I have from this well here, I want it. Yeah, I'm really intrigued by that kind of thing. Allow a person to step their way to faith because that's probably what you did when you got saved. Keep in mind, when Jesus met Nicodemus, he wasn't impatient with him, even though Nicodemus comes at night, which was a good strategy for Nicodemus. But in that day and age, when the sun went down, people began to wind down. Not a lot of things happened for the common person, so things were winding down. But Jesus was not impatient with him at all. He's not impatient with this woman here, even though he's totally worn out. He takes the questions as they come. And what eventually puts her at a place of conviction, and this, the next stage that we're going to look at next week of conversion, is when Jesus reveals himself more fully to her. But the thing is, he doesn't do it all at once. And as I said, we'll expand on this in the weeks ahead. What we are stressing here 
is to allow time. If you can, sometimes we don't. Sometimes all we have is a few moments with someone, and you have to approach it differently. But we're not talking about that setting. When you have a setting, when you're able to see someone more often, allow time for greater information and conviction to seep deeply to the root need of a person's life. But if you personally are not compelled by the gospel, the connection that you seek is going to be so much more difficult to pursue. Conviction in a person's life does not always result in someone being saved. But a person cannot get saved without it. I've had just as many opportunities when I've been able to share the gospel with somebody. And I mean, I can tell they're focused. I can tell they're under conviction. And sometimes you can just tell just by the setting that you're in. And and in fact, the most recent one, just before I left my job with the school, there was this young kid I'd talked to many times in his mid-20s, had drug problems, alcohol problems, came from a terrible home life. He was doing everything he could to ruin his job. He eventually got fired from his job on top of that. But we had talked about the gospel many times. And the very last time that I saw him, we were in the teacher's lounge, and I remember we had a chance to talk, and I was just talking for about eight or ten minutes, and he was sitting at the edge of the couch, and he was just bug-eyed on me, just listening shaking his head every now and then, and I knew he was under conviction. So I'm done with what I want to say, and he gets up and he goes, he never called me by my first name. He gets up and he goes, well, Prong, and I don't know why he would do that, but well, Prong, you almost got me on that one. And he, and he repeats it two or three times, and he walks out of the room. I never saw him again. He lost his job within a week. A person can be under heavy conviction, And a person needs to be under heavy conviction to be saved. And this is a place you want to see and try to to anticipate in someone's life. Don't allow a less than ideal opportunity to slip by you. Most of us are not going to be able to meet someone in the most comfortable of situations with others. When I am at my weakest, I don't necessarily go looking for that kind of spiritual contact. But what I have found is that when I am at my weakest, there are times that God goes looking for me. And I can just tell. I've told you about this lady that I talked to at Mark's who's behind the counter. It's the only opportunity I ever had to talk with her. There are a couple of times I've been sitting in my car. I had to go to Mark's. I knew she would be in there. I just did not want to talk about spiritual things because I was spiritually wiped out. And I could just tell God is going, no, I want you to go talk to her. I don't have any reason to go up to the customer counter. And there were many reasons, many times in the past I had no reason, but I would deliberately go up because, man, I felt engaged, powerful, and I wanted to, and it turned out really good. A couple times, no, I didn't want to. And there were a couple times I skirted by her. You know, I went down a checkout aisle instead of going this way to see her because I didn't want to talk to her. But those couple of times I could tell God came looking for me at my weakest. And you know why? because he wants to infuse his power into me to meet someone at a place of weakness for them. So if that happens to you, I could simply tell you, just relax in his power. Because whether you are weak or strong, it's the same gospel at work. Let's stand together. Let's pray. And then we'll close with a song. Our God and our Heavenly Father, We thank you for these stories that have been revealed to us in your word. We thank you that we get these close, personal, intimate pictures of what Jesus did in dealing with the life of another human being. Now, he could do it without flaw. He could do it without mistake, but he didn't do it all the time without being weak, without being at his his most worn out God. We know what it is to be worn out. He knows what it is to be worn out. And Father, we're asking, we're we're begging you, God, as you allow these opportunities to come into our lives, we know there are going to be times we are energized, we are excited, and we are powerful, and that's good. Those are good times. We should take advantage of those. But we know there are times going to be just the opposite. But God, first and foremost, beyond before any of that's going to take place, I've got to be convinced that this is what you want to do with me. 
Yes, you want to use me to come together and we need to uplift one another as believers in Christ. Absolutely. And we share our gifts with one another. Absolutely. Because we want to encourage one another. We want to worship together. We want to connect with you in a very special way like we do here in in, in a church service or in Sunday school or Wednesday night or or anything else. But Father, you have called all of us to go into the world however you have equipped us to disciple people using exactly who we are. So I would pray, God, that you would give to us a spirit of compulsion, being compelled to another, being drawn to another person in life because someone was drawn to us at one time, maybe many people, to share with us the gospel of life. So God, I just pray that you would use us as people standing up here this morning, God, use us in that way. Use us as a church body. Cause us to grow because we are really being used by you, by your spirit, to reach people who are lost, God. We thank you for this, God. We thank you for as weak as we are, for as finite as we are, for as messed up as we are. We are the primary way in which you are, that you're going to use to reach a lost world. That's amazing. That's amazing. We thank you for that, God. Cause us to be people who love you.